I haven't been given a topic for this evening and sometimes that's a good thing and sometimes not such a good thing. A few days ago I gave the talk in the university near here and they assigned me a topic and their topic was how to spend money and feel rich about it. <laughs> These were Malaysians, is that relevant? <laughs> so, I'm not quite sure what practices you do and where everybody is up to in their practice. Since you're the insight group, I presume you're having lots of insight. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the first set of talks I ever did was called the Insights of Insight Meditation. Because everybody I asked, like, what are the insights? Like, people just said, well, there's the Four Noble Truths. And like, what are the insights? And so nobody ever really tells you what the insights are. And so that was the topic of the first series of talks that I did in Bangkok. Uh, mindfulness practice is getting quite popular these days, especially in the psychology field. And it's being tested and then they start doing mindful sitting and then mindful breathing and then mindful walking and then mindful yoga and then mindful tea drinking and then mindful rugby <laughs> and then mindful this, and mindful art, and mindful music, and mindful... It goes on and on. Is that a good thing or not? I'm of two minds. I did do a degree in psychology, so I hang around with psychologists in Bangkok. The lady who set the group up with me was actually a clinical psychologist. I feel that Buddhism has a lot to offer the psychology profession. I also think there's quite a number of things that the psychology profession has got to offer to Buddhism. But I do feel that these are separate lineages with separate goals and different practices. So I like the cross fertilization, but I don't think the two should be mixed up, personally. So, when it comes to mindfulness as a real meditator, rather than as a therapeutic tool in psychology, there's a several different stages to it. Now, these are my own stages, they're not a classical teaching. First of all, when you start to practice, you will usually sit and the meditation object that most people are given is to watch the breathing. The breathing is a very handy and useful tool. I'm presuming one or two of you are fairly new to meditation. so. The breathing, especially at the abdomen, as the breath goes in, the abdomen should expand. As the breath goes out, the abdomen contracts. Many people, if they're highly stressed or they're in sports, will breathe in at the chest rather than the abdomen. And if you breathe in with the chest, this will signal your mind that you're in a fight or flight mode, that you're in a stress situation. So it'll be much more difficult to calm the mind down. So yogic breathing is always done from the abdomen. And there's a trick, if you are very close to your breath and familiar with your breath, at any point when you remember, you can just switch to breathing from the abdomen and immediately it will open up a kind of mindful presence because you've trained yourself in that way. When you put the mind onto the breathing, fairly quickly the mind will wander away onto other topics. And one way to break down or to analyze how the mind wanders away 
is we say the mind wanders into the past or the future. Generally speaking, if you are more of a depressive kind of character or dosa based character, dosa means hating but really means focusing on things that you dislike, then you will tend to wander into the past. If you are more of a lopa type, and lopa means, they translate as greed, but actually it means putting your mind onto things that you like, then you will tend to be someone who focuses their attention into the future. If you are a moha type, deluded, then there's just no hope for you. So. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a whole personality theory, a model developed around these three types, Lopa, Dosa and Moha, which is quite interesting. And how you analyze what kind of type the person is and what kind of meditation objects you give to which type of person. Wandering off into the past or the future then, you will in the meditation be trying to tie the mind into the present moment. And the present moment, if you can be with the breath, that's in the present moment. If you're doing the walking meditation and you're with your feet, that's in the present moment. If you are practicing your eating meditation, which is actually a real meditation, it's not just eating, You'll be focusing on one spoon at a time, chewing, chewing, swallowing, swallowing, in this way, tying your mind into the present moment. And there are a number of insights that come from doing that. However, if you get used to putting your mind into the present moment in that way, you start to be able to maintain that present moment awareness even if the mind is wandering into the past or the future. So the mindfulness is notched up, ratcheted up. You know what a ratchet is, right? And it clicks and it won't go back. That's a ratchet. I like tools and power tools and things. So, <laughs> But I'm aware that some people don't know what I'm talking about. One can start to see when the mind is in the past or the future, but now you're viewing it as a present moment experience. And what you do is you, you call up this image, past or future, and you start to sentiment it. It's called re-sentimenting. So you pick something from your past and you call it up into your mind. Now, five seconds before you did that, that thing was just left in your bag, your bag of stuff that you carry around with you. But then you call it up into your mind and when the idea arises, it's not really very serious. It's not a big deal. But if you start to put attention onto it, then it starts to grow and you re-sentiment it, which means you attach to those feelings from that idea too. My favorite example is from when I was 22 years old and a man stole 500 pounds off me and I know who it was and every so often this will pop up into my mind and then I think, I know who it was. No, I should have done, I should have like beaten him up. <laughs> What if we did this? Maybe if we'd really searched his room a lot harder, maybe if we put pressure on him. Well, then I start thinking, you know, I'm a monk, I'm, su I'm supposed to be forgiving and I'm supposed to be giving loving kindness, but I wonder if I can beat him, beat him up with loving kindness. <laughs> so my thinking is re-sentimenting the feeling I'm getting back. And then I reflect, hang on a minute, do I really want to pull up those feelings again? If I don't feed this image with thinking, I'm not going to get those feelings back. And then I can just see it as something that's coming up in the present moment, it's trying to grab my attention. 
and then it disappears. This trying to grab the attention is the process of attachment. So when we talk about attachment causing suffering, it's not really referring to the attachment of having a job or exams, family or pension schemes. Obviously, you have to be attached to those things. This whole life as a monk, what is it? It's a whole bunch of attachments. People give me a cake. You're trying to give me a cake earlier. I say, no, not after midday. And I, well, <laughs> am I not just attached to an arbitrary system? I mean, monks, what a monk is, is a whole series of attachments and rules and regulations. So those kind of attachments are not what cause suffering. They may do, they keep you in samsara, but they're also necessary and they're also productive of very beautiful things too. The attachment then that causes suffering is you can feel it in the present moment. As the mind is pulled off into the past or the future, you can feel the allure of that thing. When the idea, the thought, the memory or the desire has come up in that moment, there is something in there that's tugging on your attention. And that's the attachment. Now if you allow it to tug your attention in, you're going to be lost or caught up in that particular thing. And this is the word bhava which doesn't usually get mentioned very much in Buddhism. And the commentarial tradition kind of dismisses bhava as meaning the three realms, the sense-desire realm that we are in, all the way up to the Tavatingsa heaven, and then the rupa, which is the layers of heaven that are higher than that, and then the arupa, which is the formless levels of heaven. And that's how the word bhava gets described in the commentary tradition. But the word bhava actually means a conscious engagement. So the word for meditation in the Pali is bhavana. So it's a derivative of the word bhava, which means to consciously get engaged in and develop. So when you feel something in the meditation pulling you, getting your attention, that there is, if you get caught up in it and you lose your awareness, that's bhava. And most people spend most of their time caught up in activities, caught up in some kind of conscious engagement with an object. So as this insight starts to take hold, it starts to become clear that really the mindfulness is not being mindful of what you're doing in the present moment. That was the first stage. That's a useful practice. But now it starts to become clear that there actually is no past and no future. There actually is only the present moment. It's not possible to be anywhere else. Whatever past or present future is coming up, that's just right here in the present. It's just come up into your conscious engagement. Can you ever be with anything else that's except your present conscious engagement? So mindfulness has taken a turn at this point. And you can see that the times when you are not mindful is in this bhava, when you've been caught up with the allure of some kind of thinking, some kind of sense impression, and you go and get lost in it. And there are other times when you are not lost in bhava, in conscious engagement. So this then starts to become mindfulness. And one of the insights that comes from this is, even if you are in the present moment, you can still have this bhava, you can still be lost. And it occurred to me while I was living as a monk and I was trying to eat my food mindfully, one spoon at a time, 
you know, you prepare your spoonful, you put it into your mouth, you put your spoon down, chewing, chewing, swallowing, swallowing, next spoonful, and you do this. It's not very practical in my temple because my abbot's quite a quick eater. And then <laughs> So you find yourself, you don't get to your dessert and then you have to like really cram your dessert in um, so that you can finish at the right time. And it occurred to me, well, is that being mindful? Yes, the eating is present moment. I'm not in the past or the future. But I'm still in bhava. I'm still just zooming my attention in on the chewing, chewing now or the lifting of the spoon. I'm thinking, well, that also is a conscious engagement because there are a ton of sense impressions. I could be focusing on the pressure of my bum on the seat. I could be focusing my mind on the sounds that are going on around. I could be focusing my attention on the visual form of the food rather than the taste of the food. So I realized that even when you are, quote, unquote, in the present moment, you're still just engaged in this bhava. Still your consciousness, your attention is zoomed down and caught up with something. And that too can be quite alluring. It's quite peaceful just to watch the feet. If you're somebody with a mind as utterly mayhem and out of control as mine is, I mean, it's just so nice to get to your feet once in a while, just to get a break from the thinking. I also notice that the thinking that goes on actually goes on all the time, but my attention isn't always with the thinking. So I found in the meditation that I can leave the thinking, thinking about something, but my conscious attention is with something else. My conscious attention can be with the breathing, for example. And sometimes you may have had this experience. You can be doing your meditation and you're breathing in, you're breathing out. It's quite nice, it's quite peaceful. And then you just check back with the mind and you're like, oh, my mind's been thinking about stuff the whole time. Well, if you check with the ear, your ear has been hearing stuff the whole time. If you check with your tongue, your tongue has been tasting stuff the whole time. If you check with your body, your body has been feeling the whole time. So why would the mind be any different? So the mindfulness takes another turn. And you say, well, the mindfulness isn't anything to do with the object of consciousness. Mindfulness is that feeling of not being caught up in something. Now that's quite subtle. And it's tricky to explain to people. And so I think this is why most teachers say, well, focus on your feet. And if you do that, eventually you come to this kind of conclusion, I think. So the mindfulness is not being pulled into bhava, not being pulled into any kind of conscious engagement. Now, there will still be stuff in your consciousness at this time. Sounds will come in and try and grab your attention. Feelings will arise and pass away in the body and try and grab your attention. But you're not being pulled in. You maintain this sense of wakefulness or sense of awareness. Some teachers call this awareness of awareness. And what you're doing is you're turning away from all of those sense impressions. All of those practices where you watch the breath, you watch the breathing, cultivate loving kindness, is you're starting to step back and turn away from all of those things. What the conscious attention is doing is not really so relevant as this one simple quality of awareness that when you check is there with every single state of mind, but <clears throat> you're not normally aware of it. So if you're eating and you check, there is this quality of awareness. Now, one of my favorite psychologists, uh, Sue Blackmore, right, the consciousness, she wrote the book on consciousness and meme theory. 
and she describes it as the refrigerator light that every time you open the door of the refrigerator the light is on so you would naturally assume that that light is on the whole time but of course we know that the light is off when you're not looking so awareness is like this actually the light of awareness is always on but our meditation is off because we are caught up in bhava we are caught up in engaging with different things when we're not getting caught up and engaged with things the attention comes back home and you see the awareness itself now that awareness is always there but there is a difference in the quality of experience when you are remembering that awareness and when you are lost in some activity even a meditation activity so now mindfulness the Pali word is sati sampajanya and there are different forms of sati sati is usually translated as mindfulness but when you look at the suttas the original definition for sati says one can know and remember teachings that were heard long ago does that sound like mindfulness in the way that John Kabat-Zinn is teaching it to people while they're undergoing a therapy for something not to diss his work in any way but so the actual word sati means to recollect or to recall so if you call something into your mind right now that's sati if i ask you what's your mother's name what town were you born in this is information that you had but not in your conscious attention but the sati is something that calls something up into your conscious attention uh, there are different kinds of sati so there's marana sati recollection of your own mortality or recollection that you're going to die this was a common practice and a useful practice uh gaya sati which means recollection of the feelings of the body so there's many different kinds of sati but there is one special form of sati and that was sati sampajanya and this word also gets translated as mindfulness but you can see actually there's a in the pali is a different combination now sampajanya there are some arguments about what it means the commentarial tradition translates it as clear awareness so in the sutta and i believe you just did a course on the satipatthana sutta it says with mindfulness and clear awareness is the usual translation most of the rest of the time people just mix it up with mindfulness but it's a very specific form of mindfulness sampajanya according to the main manual that we have in thailand means the feeling of your own consciousness or the feeling of your own awareness so put sati and sampajanya together and it's the recollection of awareness not being aware of what you are doing being aware of your feet or or your cleaning or your talking or whatever it is that you're doing but recollection of your own awareness despite what you are doing so in the sutta it says as one stands up or sits down one clearly recollects awareness as one goes forward and goes back as one puts on one's robe as one cleans the bowl as one urinates as one defecates one maintains the recollection of awareness why is awareness such an important quality there are many aspects to your conscious attention but the buddha singled out this one particular quality 
as something that if you develop it, then it will take you to enlightenment. And what it does is it detaches you from all these things in the world. So initial stages of mindfulness will give you insights into things. Do I really need a second cream cake? Do I really want to go and buy a Porsche? If I'm getting angry at this person, is it because of the person or is it because of me? These kinds of insights come. But what are those insights for except for the detachment from those things in the world? What's it like to dwell in detachment? Well, we all have those moments of detachment. And usually what happens is the mind says, nothing really happening right now. I think I'll shut down for a bit. Or I think I'll fish something out of my bag of memories and re-sentiment that and think about that. Or the mind just goes dull, Sunday lunch mode. When I was a kid, Sunday lunches were everything shut on a Sunday. I don't know if it still does in England but or here. But everything shut on a Sunday is the most utterly boring day. <laughs> And we'd have a dinner, family dinner at one o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon. And then everybody would go into the lounge and within five seconds, all the adults, fast asleep. <laughs> and I just sit there like, come on, there'll be something on Sunday. This is what happens very often with the mind when it's not getting consciously engaged in anything. It's like, right, well, must be time to close down for a bit. And many meditators can do this in meditation and you get to that state where everything's gone quiet, you're fairly comfortable with the body, not really very much happening, and then the bell goes and you're not quite sure if you were meditating or not, but you feel kind of relaxed anyway. This is false samadhi. And if you see the Tibetan map of the meditation with the horse, with the elephant and the monk and the stick. And first of all, the horse is dragging the monk and he goes up through the chain all the way up to the sword of Vipassana. Part way up, a hare, like a rabbit hare, appears on the horse, on the elephant. And that hare represents delusion. And this is the fake samadhi that arises when you get kind of peaceful. So that state is a dead end. But it doesn't mean that you're doing the wrong thing. It means that you're getting along this path. So if this is an experience that you have, don't worry, that's a good experience. It means that you're progressing along the path. So if we consider very briefly before I wrap up, that there is this thing called enlightenment. The quality of enlightenment is it doesn't arise, it doesn't change, it doesn't age, and it doesn't cease. It's completely without self, it's completely without suffering. Now that quality must already be there. It's not a quality that you can ever develop. If you could develop that quality, it would be something that has arisen, right? So it must already be there. It's your own nature. And in Mahayana they call it Buddha nature. Or Tathagata Gata, if you... Tathagata And what can we possibly do then to get to this state of mind? We can only do it by not being caught up in the bhava, in the conscious engagement with things in the world. And as the mind withdraws from the world then, it turns around and starts to get glimpses of its own real nature. These glimpses are enough, just a slight glimpse is enough to send you off as a monk for the rest of your life. If you do psychology, Abraham Maslow talked about peak experiences, and he talked about these little fleeting experiences that really transform your character and often will cause you to rededicate your life in a totally different direction. Some people get these glimpses from 
I hear drowning is very common, you get this impression. A lot of near-death experiences, you get this. Uh, some people on drugs, they get a hint of this. Some people just in meditation get a hint of this. Some people just sitting one day by the beach and suddenly get that understanding. Just a few glimpses is enough, they say, to ensure that you will be on that path forever. There's nothing that you can do then to avoid that path. And many people try, and I've seen people really try to avoid the meditation and avoid the path. But once you've had that insight, in the Lotus Sutra it says that if you have seen even one word of the Lotus Sutra, there's nothing you can do to avoid enlightenment. It might be a very long way in the future, it might be many lifetimes. In the Tibetan tradition they say, if you have seen a scripture, nothing you can do to avoid enlightenment. So often they wear the little amulets with a tiny scripture in it, and they wear on the outside of their shirt so people can see it. So while you're walking around, anyone that looks at you, they're guaranteed perfect in enlightenment. <laughs> I understand the meaning of that to be when you get this glimpse. There's times when the, when the mind and the self and the constructed world that you live in just collapses for whatever reason and you see through it and the mind has returned home. In those moments then the path becomes clear. Even if the conscious mind and the thinking is going to have a hard time to assimilate it. I feel that it's like, I don't know, you have this tradition when people get married, do you tie tin cans on the back of the car, right? You do that? That's how I see my ego and myself rattling behind the insight that I've had. <laughs> the ego and the self and your thinking struggles to try to comprehend this insight that you can't explain, that you can't put your finger on, that you can't get it again, but you know that it was there. So then the path is a long and winding path of breaking this cycle of attachment, pulling you into bhava, your conscious attention gets sucked into your activities, and eventually withdrawing and turning the attention around and seeing your own real nature. It's 8.51, I brought it home right on the button. <laughs> <laughs>